Friends, it's my desire to see as many people come to Christ as possible. Hundreds, thousands. I think that is the most important decision of your life. But I don't want to just have a crowd. You see on the TVs, they have mega churches, and they have tens and 20,000 people going to their church, and they have famous preachers. I have no desire to be there. When I was first here, I would say, Lord, bless this church with 50 or 100 people today coming. Oh, we're ready. After about a month of that, I said, Lord, you said that if I ask them, you can take it. I don't understand. He said, chill out, watch. I think he used those words, chill out. But what amazed me was how he did this. We're up to 33 members. We operate somewhere around 30, 35 people a week, 40 people a week, uh, just in that neighborhood. It is a blessing to me to see that. But brick by brick, person by person, I got to know you. I get the blessing to know you. I don't want to preach for me. I want to preach to the, for you to become disciples of Christ. To grow in Christ. That's my goal. And that's what I think that preacher was talking about. I want to see people get saved because they've been on their journey and they said, Jesus is right. I want to give my heart to him and then sell out to be a disciple for Christ. It's interesting to read the way Jesus deals with those who express the desire. He seems to discourage them, but at the same time, he's not doing that. The actual fact, Jesus desires that he wants all of us to follow him. But he wants them to think. Think about it. He doesn't want you to make an emotional decision. He wants you to make a good, sound, solid decision. He is Christ. He came out of heaven and died for your sins. He is worthy. And he calls you for that. But he doesn't want you to make an emotional decision and then turn around a month later and fall away. He doesn't want anybody to ever turn back. Think about it. Even as he spells out what is required in such clear and shocking terms that we just read inside, he's longing them, longing for them to accept it. He's rooting for them. But the cost is the cost. It's non-negotiable. And they and us must be willing to pay the cost. Look with me. All three men who Jesus confronts with his demands Consider with me the cost of following Jesus. We read the first man in Jesus' conversation with him. We learned that the follower of Jesus has no earthly security. Luke 9, 57 and 58. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever so thou, thou goest. And Jesus said, And foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. That's a quite bold, uh, quite bold statement that he makes. I will follow you wherever you go. Can you say that? Without any idea where Jesus wants to lead you, can you say that? What may be involved in this journey? Perhaps you need more information. Then if you're still willing to follow, that's good and well. Jesus replies to him, Wherever he's going will not be an easy road. That was a funny little joke at the beginning, wasn't it? But isn't it true? Being a Christian in this world is not an easy road. Jesus was not a high-flying rabbi that was telling people, follow me, and look, i got a jet, and I'm going to fly to village to village, staying with the best hotels. I'm getting paid. His ministry was a faith ministry. And he calls us to that ministry. Jesus stepped out of his throne in glory to come to earth, to live and to die. He left behind all he had. He took on the image of man. Have you ever thought of that? He left heaven. He is God and left it all behind and came here taking on the image of man to what? To die for us. He left it all behind. He exchanged wealth for poverty. An ivory palace for some nasty cattle barn. He exchanged rulership for servanthood. And then he says, Foxes have holes, birds of the uh, air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you finding the, uh, the, the interesting 
paradox here? What an irony. The king of glory, the heir apparent to the throne of the universe, doesn't even have a place to call his home. No earthly security. He was loaned accommodation by those who loved him. He borrowed a coin to tell a story. He borrowed a donkey to ride into Jerusalem to fulfill prophecy. He was even buried in a, a borrowed tomb. He didn't need it that long, did he? Praise God. He had nothing. Oh, but here I see his glory shining. He gave it all up when he came here and stood by me. He gave it all up when he came here and stood by you as your Savior. He is worthy. And those who follow him must be prepared for the same road. No earthly security. Now you notice I didn't say no security. There's great security in following Jesus. Not earthly security. It's not about your possessions. It's not about your money, your homes and such things. It's about your heart. Matthew 10, 39 says, He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Then we read of the second man that came to Jesus. His conversation, we learn that Jesus, the follower of Jesus, has no earthly ties. Luke 9, uh, 59 and 60. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Here's a conversation that has to shock a lot of people. It shocked me when I read it the first time. Jesus calls this man to be his disciple, but he begs to leave to go bury his dead. That seems like a reasonable request, doesn't it? Did you read that thing? Well, that's, I kind of understand that. The guy needs to go bury his father. But Jesus replies, let the dead bury their dead. I called you to preach for me now. Whew. There's a cost. The point Jesus makes here is let, and let no one mistake this, is that if you're going to follow Jesus Christ and the claims of the kingdom become, come first and foremost in your life before anyone or anything in your life, the kingdom of God has to be first. Jesus also says, He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Tough words, isn't it? Now you get the picture of the kind of devotion that he's actually calling us for. He's not calling us to dishonor our parents. He's not calling us to walk away from your family. But what he's saying is if we're pressed into a choice between the two, Jesus has to come first. Have you ever asked yourself in your heart, what would I do? Or have you ever been put in that situation? I will tell you, Vicki and I have been put in that situation. Vicki and I are in that situation right now. Sometimes you have to make a choice. Sometimes, is it going to be your family or is it going to be Jesus? Jesus clearly says, you have to have that kind of devotion if you're going to follow me. Not all of us will have to make that decision. We did. That's just us. You all right, buddy? Okay. You're so good. <laughs> the follower of Jesus has no ultimately earthly ties. Jesus says, leave it all behind. Can you believe it? Leave it all behind. In America, we hold on to it, don't we? I don't want to give up anything. Jesus says, leave it behind. Let me cast a little light on that conversation also. He says, let me go first and bury my father. Might help if we understand the Jewish funeral procedure that goes on at that time. It's different than America. Uh, the initial barrier is very short. Uh, takes place right after the person's demise. Uh, the man's not locked away in mourning. So he's out seeking Jesus so we can assume that the burial has already taken place. But they had a tradition within one year you, the son comes back, and I won't get into the graphics of it, but the son comes back and he reburies the bones of his father in the tomb. He puts them in a new box and he puts them in the tomb. So he was saying, let me go uh, bury my father. Jesus is saying, basically, I'm calling you, and your first response is, let me have a year off, and then I'll be ready. Make sense? 